Welcome to this uh, NPTEL workshop, NPTEL IBM workshop on, uh, and I have come up with a name for it, what is it? Robotics and Artificial Intelligence or Artificial Intelligence Report, whatever order you may take it. Uh, so we have a series of very interesting events throughout the day. Uh, we are kicking it off with a high level introduction to deep reinforcement learning, learning from one of the experts in the area. Uh, Professor Ravindran from uh, Computer Science Department in IIT Madras. He's been working in reinforcement learning for 20 years now. Uh, before that, he did a PhD from uh, Massachusetts Amherst. And his advisor there, uh, Andrew Barto, is one of the inventors of this uh, fair area. So, he's a really an expert, and he give up what he says is a gentle introduction. Very, very, gentle. very gentle introduction to <laughs> deep reinforcement learning, and I'm sure it'll be an enjoyable experience for us. And after that. Uh, Mr. Vishal uh, Sahal from IBM Research Labs in Bangalore uh, is on his way here. So once he gets here, uh, he will talk about the main uh, topic of this uh, workshop. That's the plan for the day. Okay, so hopefully that's uh, clear to you. Once again, a uh, very warm welcome to all of you. Hope, uh, hope you enjoyed uh, this whole experience. And and uh, many of us, I think there are quite a few IITM students also here, but also quite a few students from outside IITM. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you are from outside IITM? Yes, how many of you are from IITM? Not bad. It's a pretty really decent mix. Uh, all of you, I'm not sure if you're used to a classroom where you're to be silent or not, but I think I can show you, Professor Ravindran, be very happy with any interruptions or questions. Things yeah, like that. I'll be happy if all the conversations are to me, <laughs> <laughs> not, not among yourselves. Yeah, so please uh, stop them if you have any questions or even towards the end or something. Like that. Feel free to. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot once again and over to Professor Thank you. So, morning, folks. And like uh, Sandro was saying, uh, yeah, it's a long weekend. Uh, happy that uh, somebody of you turned up. And so, I am going to talk about deep reinforcement learning, which is one of the reasons there is a lot of uh, recent excitement in uh, AI. And uh, I will really keep this talk very, very, very light. And that's that's the reason you see the thing. Deep reinforcement learning. I am going to not have a single uh, equation on any of the slides. If you have watched my typical videos, you know that it is uh, not typical. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to keep it as as light as uh, possible, right? And uh, if you have any questions, any points that you want to raise, uh, just put up your hands and interrupt me and ask those questions. Uh, because uh, usually, I mean, I have a lot of slides and I probably won't finish in an hour. And if you're going to wait for me to finish at the end and then ask questions, there might not be enough time, right? So the moderator will probably say, oh, please take all the questions offline. If you have questions, just ask it from the Okay. So, a lot of excitement about AI, right? So, let me read the one at the top. The Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Wow. Right? A lot of excitement about AI and all this thing, right? But, these articles are from 1958. They are not from now. Even though it sounds like it could have been, right? It could have appeared in the newspaper yesterday, right? And uh, so, why, why all this thing is happening? Right? So, AI goes back a long, long way, right? So, 1950s, like Alan Turing asked this question: Can machines think? Right? And then he proposed what is now called the Turing test, right? It was it was a test of intelligence, right? And uh, then, in 1956. So, it was uh, one of the first official use of the term artificial intelligence. Right? So, it is called the Dartmouth AI project. It started in 1956 and then people declared artificial intelligence as a new field of study and a lot of work happened then. Right? Then you could see what was happening then. Right? So, 50 was Turing test, 55 something we defined something called AI is born. Right? And then uh, you get a fast industrial robot right? and then you have a chatbot called Eliza. And look at the days here, right? People talk about robotics and chatbots and all those things now, right? We have we already went through this cycle once, right? And then Shaky was the first electronic person, right? Does it ring a bell? So somebody from Saudi Arabia was coming and 
talking in various things recently, right? But then you have the same thing happened in 1966, right? So Shaky came out of the uh, SRI lab, right? And uh, then what happened? There are many false starts, many dead ends, right? And about the same time that Shaky came on the field, right? So people gave up automatic machine translation. That's the first. First attempt at automatic machine translation using AI. I say therefore it's really not possible for an AI to truly understand language and capture all the nuances of it. Right? And then uh, in 1970s, people forgot all about the first generation of what were called neural networks. Right? They forgot all about that and they say, oh, it is not going to work. And kind of culminated in 88 by the US government saying that they will not fund any more research in anything called AI. So it came to that point, unimaginable. Right? Everybody is falling over themselves to fund anything that has the word AI in it. And uh, so that started the first of many AI readers. Right? And it has had severe lasting effect. Look at that, that is a statement from 2006. Right? Some believe the word robotics actually carries a stigma that hurts a company's chance at funding. And all of you here are attending a workshop on AI and robotics, right? So, assuming that uh, all of this is going to change in the near future. So, why, why again all this, all this excitement about AI, right? So, we, we saw this very similar hype cycle happened in the 60s and 70s, and then things plummeted, and now again, we seem to be going through a hype cycle. So, what has caused this impact? So, one word, something called deep learning. So deep learning has been around in some form or the other, right, from the 80s at least, right? but then we have gotten things to work much better now. And so this is a, the first kind of big ticket application of what uh, deep learning achieved was in uh, this kind of uh, image categorization. Right? So I will give you different pictures and you have to figure out what is being uh, described in that picture. So is it an airplane, automobile, bird, cat, deer, and so forth. I will give you a picture, you have to assign a label to the picture. And uh, so you could see that we are getting to very, very low error rates. So 3.6 percent error means out of 100 pictures, I make on average error on 3 and a half pictures. Right? Sometimes it's hard for even you to make out. Right? That is why all the all visual illusions and other things are so popular because uh, human eye can be easily fooled. And in fact, deep learning has managed to achieve what you would call superhuman performance. Right? In the sense that it can be head to head against humans. Okay, kind of better than humans on huh? this kind of visual categorization test nowadays. Right? So that is one of the reasons for a lot of the hoopla. So what really changed since 2006? So there are three things that I would say happened. So there were new methods and new algorithms, right, that were proposed. There was a better understanding of what was causing things to fail earlier. Right? So people just thought that it was a very specific reason called, uh, you know, so essentially we are trying to train too many parameters, right? we are trying to learn too many, there are too many moving parts in, in, in the neural network and you are not able to train them appropriately, right? but it turns out that that was not really the reason and uh, there were several other things that were causing it, so once these understanding uh, kind of came about, right? so we were able to come up with better algorithms that were more stable and could train millions of parameters. And the second thing of, of, of course is more data. Right? In the modern day, everything is digitized right? and uh, so you are able to gather data at a much, much greater pace than you could earlier. So that also helps you um, get um, better and better solutions. And the last thing, kind of hand in hand with the development in algorithms and the availability of data, you had better machines, you had faster machines right? that allowed you to run your algorithms at a rate much, 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 much faster than what was possible even a couple of decades ago or even a decade ago. Right? It run much faster than what was possible uh, a decade ago. Right? And so there are a lot of success stories. So I am pretty sure we hear some from IBM. Right? Uh, so there are a lot of uh, human-like tasks which AI is supposed to perform like speech recognition, object recognition, face recognition, right? machine translation, understanding text and so on and so forth which now Machines are able to perform, right? And uh, and of course, these are not just things that were there in academic 
labs, right? These are now developed by companies, there are products out there that use all of these, and uh, um, right? and IBM is in the forefront of uh, many of these areas. So you hear about uh, IBM side of things, and uh, so this is largely uh, the work of uh, a few individuals. Right? So this uh, Jeff Hinton, who was at the University of Toronto, now heads uh, Google Brain. And then Yashua Benju in the University of Montreal, uh, whose case put at the University of Montreal and they're building this huge AI empire around it. It's an amazing story. And then Jan Lekun, who was at the NYU, uh, but also heads Facebook AI research now. Right. And of course, I have to add another person there. Uh, so there's another person, uh, Schmidt Huber, who is in uh, uh, Zurich, India, uh, who has also contributed significantly to this revival in uh, uh, Europe. Right. In fact, it's amazing that some of the modern architectures that we use in neural networks have been around since the 80s. Right. We just figured out how to use them correctly now. So we can do amazing things with neural networks. Here is one example. Look at that. So somebody gives you a picture and a style, right? and a neural network is able to redraw the picture using that style. Right? So I give you a sketch, right? And the neural network is able to fill in. Oh my God, that looks like a Monet, right? So it can it can do impressionist. It is basically trained on impressionist paintings, right? And it's able to give you, given a picture like this, it's able to give you that painting thing. Or it can do this kind of colorization. So a whole bunch of things which are normally you would associate as creative activities, right? Something like an AI, right? And there are other things like look at that. This is a caption that was generated by an automatic system. Right? That's a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Very accurate description. Right? Of course, it still makes some errors. Right? There's a little girl in a pink hat and she is blowing bubbles. According to the caption. Uh, so, I mean, I can do amazing things. So, this is a picture on uh, how uh, uh, AI agents have been doing on automatic speech recognition. Right? So, you can see that about 2010. Somebody understands only 60% of what you say, right? You'll probably think they are from a different generation, right? So, right? So, but like you're talking to your parents or parents talking to their children, so only 60% of the things will be understood. Right? So, you'll probably think something like that, right? But then, look at that. Once deep learning got on board, you have reached something like 95% or even better. Right? That blue line up there is human accuracy. So, right now we are able to beat. Human accuracy. Using these, right? And this has given rise to all kinds of uh, personal assistance, right? So no robotic voices. So you are able to understand speech well, and you are also able to generate speech, very natural sounding speech also. So that's uh, happening. And so apparently, I, mean, I was not aware of this until like yesterday. We started putting these slides together. Uh, that uh, the the fraction of voice searchers right, is going up significantly. So I, I don't really trust my phone yet to do voice search on it, but apparently it is good. Right? So you can see that about 50 billion voice searches per month is what's happening now. That's the level of confidence that uh, people have. And uh, perhaps the next generation will grow up uh, with uh, the assurance that machines will understand them all the time. Right? And uh, But let's get to get moving. Uh, so more recently, there has been a lot of excitement about some things. Right? So there's uh, uh, an agent called AlphaGo. How many of you have heard of AlphaGo? Okay, a good fraction. And what fraction of that was from IIT? <laughs> okay, so AlphaGo. Uh, so let me t t tell you a little bit about the game Go. Right. Uh, so the game Go is actually a very ancient game. I think I've been playing this for centuries, and uh, it has a very very simple rules, right? So the, the tagline for Go is a minute to learn and a lifetime to master. Right? Because that's how simple the rules are. But then as the gameplay progresses, you'll see a lot of different patterns that evolve. Right? And it has been considered one of like one of the final frontiers of AI, right? If you can get an agent that can play Go, then we can say that you're making progress in AI. Right? So, uh, so people have been trying this for a long time, right? Until uh, uh, the mid 2000s, right? There's no real success. Right? Uh, even in getting like a okay Go player, right? and then uh, there's some work that was done uh, that allowed uh, people to get a decent 
go player. Not necessarily somebody who is competitive with humans, but at least somebody who you can train with to begin to learn how to play go or things like that. Right? And then, in 2015, uh, this company DeepMind came up with this agent called AlphaGo. Right? And uh, AlphaGo started playing really well. And initially, it beat the European champions 5 0. And then they said, okay, let us go up against uh, one of the best known uh, uh, players of Go. Right? And uh, so, Go is, is one of those games which have like almost religious following, right? So, they have actually records of gameplay going back decades and centuries, right? And uh, Lee Sidal is the guy who is considered one of the strongest players of Go ever, right? He's supposed to be one of those. Genius level types, and so they decided to go up against him. So, how popular is Go? So, when uh, AlphaGo had a matchup against Lee Sidol in Seoul, right, they were actually live casting the game on the street corners by putting up huge LCD screens. I mean, that people used to stand in the street corners and watch the game, right? That's how popular the game Go is. And then they decided that uh, uh, they'll go up against him, and uh, the, the, the initial, you know, the initial. Uh, you know, the press was all about, we hope that we don't make a fool of ourselves. You know, we hope AlphaGo is able to hold its own against Lee Sidon and so on and so forth. And uh, by the time the fourth game came around, right, people were actually surprised that Lee Sidon managed to win the fourth game. Because AlphaGo was playing so strongly in the first three games that uh, people had given up hope for, the, for uh, Lee Sidon to actually beat the game engine. But it did win, he did win the fourth game. And then promptly the engine went back and did some more training and came back and defeated him in the fifth game. Right? So they ended up winning 4-1. AlphaGo ended up winning 4-1. And there's a lot of buzz about it, right? So there was this one person uh, who was who was uh, kind of covering the game, right? writing commentary about the games and then analyzing the games later. And he said that for the first time in my life, I felt like I was watching an alien intelligence in action. Because I could not make any sense out of the moves that were happening while the game was progressing. But later on, I went back and analyzed it, then I could see what was happening. So that's the kind of impact uh, AlphaGo had. And uh, of course, one of the unfortunate side effects of all of this is it also accelerates the hype cycle. Right? So now more and more people are getting on board uh, with this. And um, so to be fair to Lee Sidol, I believe he's the last human being who actually defeated AlphaGo at the game of Go. Since then, all the other human matchups that they have had. AlphaGo has been winning 5 0. So obviously, I mean, if we take the current version of AlphaGo and play against Lee Sirol, I don't know what will happen. It will probably be winning 5 0 as well, but uh, still. <coughs> and then, uh, closely behind that, uh, there was this uh, strategy game called the Defense of the Ancients. And it's a lot more complicated in terms of trying to understand the rules of the game than Go itself. Right? There are a lot of different components. And then you have to do some long term strategizing and things interact in very different ways and so on and so forth. And uh, so it, it turned, it's a much more uh, complex dynamics than a board game. Uh, but then uh, uh, OpenAI, uh, which is an organization funded by Elon Musk, right, um, which uh, they built an um, agent uh, that managed to beat humans in tournament play. And we win the tournament. It's like it's going against humans and run the tournament. Of course, this was a simpler version right, than the full uh, defense of the ancient uh, game because uh, apparently you can form teams and then you can have coalitions and fight and so on and so forth. But they made it a single player version. It's still, it's a non trivial, uh, non trivial achievement. So, all of this uh, caused a lot of excitement right, about uh, uh, what are the boundaries that you can push. Right? So, I'll tell you why these two applications were different from all the things that we saw earlier, right? So that's what this talk is about. So what is it that caused these things to cause uh, so much excitement, right? So people are familiar with machine learning. Many of you have here have, uh, either have suffered through my hands at here at IIT or, or have seen some version of it on NP right? So you have some familiarity with machine learning. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, just give you a little reference. But this talk is all about learning to control. The familiar models of machine learning are all about learning from data. So what do I mean by that? So I give you some past, I had to learn some functions from input to the output. Right? Uh, I'll give you some past data. So it could be like credit card transactions and whether they were legal or not. 
right? Or uh, customer data, whether they bought a uh, equipment from you or not, right? And that this kind of training data is given to you, right? And your goal is to learn to predict on unseized data. So if a new customer comes in, can you predict whether they buy a computer or not? Right? Or if a new credit card transaction is posted, can you tell me whether it was a fraudulent transaction or not? So the goal is, given this kind of past data, like if we call training data, can you figure out how to make predictions on unseen data? And the goal here is essentially to uncover whatever patterns that exist in the data and use that to make these predictions. Right? So here is an example. So I have a email, right, and I want to classify that as whether it's a spam or not. So this was considered a reasonably hard problem about 15 years back, but then machine learning has solved it like anything, and uh, you rarely get any spam land in your inbox on email. If anything, it errors on the other side. Right? Some of legal mails go into spam, but most mostly it's, it's, it's fine. Right? So how do you train such a system? All I'm going to do is I want this model, right? That's going to give me spam or not spam. So what I'm going to do is take a bunch of my old emails, right? That have been labeled as spam or not spam already. Right? So in the olden days, you would have moved more often. You would have moved your emails into spam folders and things like that. Right? But check it as spam or go and check it as non spam and so on. So that's, you are essentially producing this kind of training data when you do that. So you get these kind of labeled data. Right? And then feed it into a learning algorithm and it will spit a model. So what does the learning algorithm do? Learning algorithm tries to find a mapping right, that takes the input, that's we call it x, right, and gives you a plus or a minus one depending on whether it's spam or not spam. And the goal is to find a mapping such that the fraction of examples on which this model makes a mistake is very much. I'm not going to get into the mechanics of how you train it and so on and so forth. But the goal of what you are trying to do is this. So the crucial thing here is I am given this kind of training data which consists of what we will call as supervision or inspection. Very detailed supervision. If this is the mail, then it's spam. If this is a mail, then it is not spam. Right? I give you very, very detailed for every input that you are going to see. I am going to give you what the output should be. Right? So we call this as detailed supervision. Right? So this is what I mean by learning from data. So you already have this past data with all these labels. And then you are going to learn from that, right? So now let me ask you this question. How did you learn to cycle? Was it from past data? I can show you 15 videos on YouTube. I can show you 3 million videos of people cycling, right? And, and, then, and then maybe another 15 million videos of people falling off cycle and getting hurt in all kinds of funny ways. Now, after watching all these videos, can you get on a cycle and cycle? You can't. Okay. So you need to do some kind of trial and error. No amount of labeled data is going to help you. Or if you want to go back and look at how we did the spam, not spam classification, right? Actual labeling here should be of the following uh, type, right? My cycle is tilted at 27 degrees to the vertical, and I'm moving forward at so many like meters per second. So, with what pressure should I push down my right leg? So, that is the kind of supervision you would need if you are going to look at it in exactly the spam classification. Well, that's not the kind of supervision you are going to get. So, usually when I ask this question, hey, did you use supervised learning for learning to cycle? There will be a few people in the audience who will say, yes, I was supervised by my parent or I was supervised by my uncle and so on and so forth. But that is not really supervision. I mean, that's in an English sense, it's supervision but not in a machine learning sense. What, what would the uncle or parent could have done? Right? They would have probably clapped when you cycle properly <laughs> or when your cycle tilted too much, they would have held you from falling down or something like that. Right? So what you are getting was more evaluation. You do something. Right? Somebody comes and tells you, hey, that was good or bad. Nobody tells you what to do. You have to try. Right? You have to do this kind of trial and error and figure out what to do. So, of course, you get feedback, falling down hurts. Or, or somebody claps and it feels good, right? so you get this kind of feedback and then uh, you learn from that. And it's just not cycling, it's just not cycling, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot more. Right? So imagine, go back, I, I chose the example of cycling because it's more likely that people remember, right? but they don't remember how they learn to walk. And unless you have babies and you are watching them walk, then, uh, then you remember, right? But uh, the thing is, babies do all kinds of trial and error work. 
So nobody teaches them how to walk. Right? Nobody teaches you how to talk. You learn a lot of vocalization, and then somebody says, yeah, good, good, good. Remember, if it was supervised learning, I should have told you how to move your throat muscle, okay, where I should keep your uh, diaphragm and things like that, right? I'm not doing that. You try different things, and then when you finally it will give me, give me an output, yeah, okay, yeah, that's good. So you're not getting instruction, you're getting evaluation. So if you go back and think about why people are getting excited about Go, it was because it was trained in exactly this manner. Nobody gave it detailed instruction. It learned by playing. It plays games, it wins, it loses, and then it learns through this kind of uh, trial and error process. The same thing with the, the Dota thing. Right? There are a lot of other applications, I'll talk about those as we go along. And uh, so the, the goal of reinforcement learning is, uh, is, is to do this trial and error learning. Right? So, one way of thinking, of what, uh, thinking about what reinforcement learning is, it is a mathematical formalism for this kind of trial and error learning. Right? So you have rewards and punishments and uh, you learn to maximize some notion of long term performance, the rewards that I get over time. Right? So I want to optimize it. And uh, the key here is you learn about a system through interaction with the system. It's, it has very rich history, right? So reinforcement learning uses ideas from a variety of disciplines, right? It uses ideas from operations research, it uses ideas from optimal control, right? But uh, the initial uh, reinforcement learning uh, Explorations were done in a field called behavioral psychology. So, people have heard of Pavlov's dog. Right? So, so, normally when you have a dog, right, it will salivate when you give it food. Right? It's preparing to digest the food, therefore, it's not salivating. It needs to get ready to actually uh, digest the food in its mouth itself. Right? So, normally when you ring a bell, that's a rather sad looking dog, but it's probably, probably going to be barking at you. When you ring a bell, you probably bark back at you. But it's not going to be salivated. So what Ivan Pavlov did was whenever he presented food to the dog, he also rang a bell. After a few such presentations, what happens is if you ring a bell, the dog starts salivating. So what has happened is through this experience of seeing the bell and the food together, it has learned to associate the bell with a reward. The reward in this case is the food, and then it says, oh, okay, I hear the bell, so I'm going to get ready for processing the reward. It learns these kinds of associations through interaction with the world. Here it's a very simple uh, association because the dog did not have to do anything. It just had to process the input that you're getting. Uh, but this is a very similar mechanism by which uh, you train a lot of animals. Right? You give them small reward, I mean, people have dogs, you know how you train the dogs, so whenever they do something good, you give it some reward, and therefore they eventually uh, learn to do what you want them to do. So this kind of uh, training is called conditioning, right? behavioral conditioning and uh, the first reinforcement learning models uh, were actually proposed uh, to explain, uh, mathematically explain right? this kind of behavioral conditioning. So I am going to use a simple example to illustrate one of the key concepts behind reinforcement learning. Tic-tac-toe. So people are familiar with tic-tac-toe? So, I presume uh, a lot of you have played tic-tac-toe. Yep. I'm pretty sure many of you have played tic-tac-toe during classes also. It's not something that's not uh, to do with classes, right? So, so, I'm going to say that if you win, you get a point. If you lose, you get minus one. And if you draw, you get zero. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you how to play the game. You have to play, to learn it through repeated play. It's a very simple enough situation. You can write down your optimal rule, but just for illustration purposes. Right, so you start off with a blank, then there are three possible or nine possible moves you can make and then each one has more and so on and so forth. This is what is called as a game tree, where you are looking at all possible outcomes of the game. And uh, so let's start off with one very simple approach to learning to play tic tac uh, This was uh, proposed by Mitchie and Chambers in, this, in 1916. Uh, they built something called Menace. Right, so what does Menace stand for? It sounds very menacing. Uh, it stands for matchbox educable knots and crosses engine. Knots and crosses is what the British is called tic tac toe. Right? Knots and crosses. Right? And uh, so matchbox educable knots and crosses engine. This menace. Uh, but the idea was that they had this set of matchboxes and some colored beads, right? And then they demonstrate, right? They do live demonstrations of the set of matchboxes learning to play tic-tac-toe. So the way they did this is follows. 
each match box right is labeled with some board position that you can see this here so this has two x's and two o's and x is supposed to make a move next right so whenever you come to a specific board position you go and open the match box corresponding to that board position it's going to have different colored beads inside and each color bead corresponds to one move that you could make in each color bead corresponds to one move that you could make so for example here there are one two three four five positions so there should be five different color beads in that but there would be more people there should be five different color beads in that match box right and you have many many copies of each bead each color right so what you do is you open the match box pull out a bead at random and don't look at the color of the bead just pull out a bead at random see what is that bead right and make a move corresponding to that right then you leave the match box open and remember the bead that you took out right and continue playing until the end right there's an opponent that responds to your move then you continue playing till the end and then at the end if you win you put back two beads of the color you drew from each match box if you lose you throw away the bead if you draw you put back the bead in there and close the match box so what is happening here whenever you win what have we done you have increased the number of beads of that color that cost you to win right so the next time you pull a bead out at random the chances that you will pull out that same color has gone up slightly right so what what you have done here is whenever you win you increase the probability of the move that led to the win whenever you lose because you threw away that bead so decreasing the probability of the move that led to the loss and whenever you draw you leave the probability at zero very very simple idea right they just did this with match boxes and beads and marbles and stuff like that right? and then people were completely blown away they said wow an intelligent set of match boxes right because they learned how to play these they came from it right in fact uh, this became so popular that michi and chambers had to actually take it around in a touring exhibition they go to different cities they set up the match box and demonstrate how it learns to play they used to have scheduled showings where you can come at 6 pm and watch the match box learn okay, now we can of course go go online and look for the menace page and you should see some video demonstrations of that and so on and uh, it's easy enough you can write uh, 10 lines of code and set up the menace engine and then you can watch it uh, uh learn right so let's go back and think about uh, what we were doing here right so this is a game tree so what did i do here was the following i started off at the beginning with all blanks then i played one game right let's say i play a game all the way to the end okay and then what i do i look at the outcome i'll see if there was a win or a draw right based on the outcome i'll go back and update the probabilities of the various moves i took along the way this is essentially what i'm doing i'm waiting till the end okay but suppose suppose i encounter a position like this somewhere along the plane or like this somewhere along the plane right or even this is good yeah i encounter a position like this along the plane so what can you tell me from here is it going to be a win or a loss so i mean remember you're playing x not not o this is going to be a win or a loss it's going to be a win right at this point i don't even have to wait for you to finish playing the game i know it's going to be a win so why do i need to wait till i finish the game Right. If I am able to come to a position like this, already I can say, "Hey, it's a win," and start updating the probabilities of all the game moves that are going to be there. Right? Makes sense. I don't have to wait till the end. Right. In fact, if I start learning, I don't have to wait to see a position like this where I am sure about winning. Right. I can just look at. Okay, here is a position. How likely am I to win from here? From all the learnings that I have already played. and then i can use that to update the previous position i don't have to wait all the way to the end because as i am playing i know more about whether i am likely to win or not by just looking one step ahead right that that i know correctly so that's the the key idea here right if i am one step further down right i have a better idea of whether i'm going to win or lose or what's the eventual outcome right so that i can use the predictions that i can make one step down 
to update the predictions I will make now. Right, whether I'm going to make or not. So, this kind of an idea of using predictions that are further down in time to update the predictions that come earlier in time is called temporal difference learning. Right? So, this is the whole notion of uh, temporal difference learning. It turns out that this simple idea actually explains a lot of the complex behavioral experiments that people were running. It turns out that humans and animals have this kind of a temporal difference notion running in our head and we tend to use this kind of future predictions to update our current models. So this was proposed by uh, Bartow, Sutton, and Anderson in 83 and it's considered the key paper that kind of marks the, uh, the modern study of uh, reinforcement learning. So that's Bartow, Sutton, and Anderson. Right. And so Sutton and Bartow have written the kind of the basic defining textbook in RL now. And uh, very recently, last week, they put out the second edition online. Uh, so people want to learn more. Uh, it's actually a very easy read book. And so not just in AI, right? So this uh, temporal difference had had uh, profound impact in behavioral psychology, in neuroscience, in operations research, and in uh, control theory. Right. So this whole idea has been used uh, extensively in many, many different fields. So it's been used in a variety of domains. Right? So I'll talk about a few in more detail. And in fact, this is something where you are experiencing RL on a daily basis. So whenever you have all these advertisements that are popping up on Google, uh, there is some amount of reinforcement learning nothing behind it. Because it's very hard for me to give supervision. Because different kinds of people are coming to my web page every day. Right? Uh, millions of keywords that are being typed in. And, uh, the set of advertisements I have keep changing on a very regular basis, like every half hour I have a different set of advertisements coming in and so on and so forth. So I have some amount of this trial and error component in my learning. If I show you an advertisement, if you click on it, then it's, I did something good. If you don't click on it, well, that might be a variety of reasons. And if you say don't show me the ad, right, I don't know how many of you have noticed, uh, Google now has this thing about don't show me an ad, because you can go and say that and uh, that it takes it as a negative reinforcement. Right? So that was not available earlier. So earlier if you don't click on that, you might be busy, you might not have the time. It's not necessarily that you don't like that. Now they are giving you a way to say that if you don't like that. So that allows us to get better training. So that is essentially what uh, uh, reinforcement learning role is there. So I will talk a bunch about all of these now. Right? And so one of the uh, applications of RL that created a lot of buzz uh, was uh, an autonomous uh, helicopter flying. Right? So, so people who are familiar with online courses must recognize that guy. Right? Andrew. Yes, Andrew. Andrew. Right? So, uh, hey Andrew, who's Andrew? So, Andrew uh, is uh, uh, so he did this as part of his PhD work and then continued to work on it when he moved to Stanford as a faculty. And the idea here was amazing, right? So, you're training this helicopter. Or rather, we are training a pilot to this helicopter through reinforcement classes. So there are many, many control actions that you can take and then, uh, well, if you cause the helicopter to crash, you get a penalty, if, you're back, if you keep it balanced and then you keep continuing to fly. Then you learn some kind of amazing, amazing stuff. Right? And of course, he did train on a real helicopter so that uh, it didn't crash really crashed the helicopter, he turned it right on a simulator, which was a very, very detailed simulator. And then, once he was confident that it's going to work, he put it on a real helicopter. Of course, the real helicopter had a fail-safe mechanism. At, at any point of time, the learning agent causes it to tip over very dangerously or something, it will cut in, right? And it will be treated like a crash, so the agent will get punished, but the controller will make sure that the helicopter doesn't crash. And then they have come to a point where, they can do all kinds of amazing things like even inverted flight. So helicopters can't fly upside down. They are not designed to fly upside down normally. It's an extremely unstable configuration, but still they manage to uh, get it to fly uh, upside down. So this is an amazing, amazing uh, uh, experiment. Here's another one. Uh, that's uh, Peter Stone from uh, UT Austin. Right? So one of the things I like about this, uh, this demo is that they use reinforcement learning to solve a specific problem in a very, very large complex domain. Right? So here the domain is to train this kind of humanoid robots to play soccer. Right? 
a lot of work has been done on getting humanoids to walk, right? Strategizing for a soccer game and so on and so forth. It's not like you want to use reinforcement learning end to end in these kinds of experiments. So what they did was they looked at what was hard for them to solve using conventional techniques and then figured out that hey, kicking the ball is something that's hard for them to solve. So they trained a reinforcement learning agent to kick the ball and you can see how well it learns to kick the ball. In fact, it becomes embarrassing. Uh, quite often, it can just kick the ball into the goal from uh, <coughs> long distances away. Right? And so, it started winning football games with scores of like 14 to 0, 20 to 0, and so on. So, they ended up scoring 88 goals or something like that. It was like, <coughs> like embarrassingly large margin. It started winning. And of course, later on, people figured out how to alter this, but. Uh, uh, this is one, the next goal right, this will be from really far away and then and skip forward. Right, so it became so embarrassing. At some point of time, it will actually, if you watch the whole video, you can go to the uh, UT Austin Austin Villa page. Uh, there are a lot of videos. At some point of time, it will actually kick from the halfway mark into the goal. Right, it's, it becomes uh, so good at it. Uh, but the point was, when they tried to write rules, right, or write it using uh, traditional mechanisms, uh, they were finding it hard to get to kick in the right direction and and uh, control the ball and so on and so forth. And then they set it up as a reinforcement learning problem. So what is the reinforcement learning problem here? Well, if you kick the ball in the direction that I want you to kick it in, then you get a very high reward. Okay, the farther away you are from the direction, your reward becomes smaller and smaller. So, so for, if you want to maximize the reward, you have to kick it in the direction. Anyway. So that's basically it. And uh, so we're going to talk about one more application here, which is the game playing agent. Right? Again, so there's this game called Backyard. So one of the things you guys should have realized if you have learned AI and things like that, that AI folks uh, like a lot of games. So games are nice because they are easily simulatable, right? And uh, they have enough complexity in it, so you can actually think about solving problems that are non-trivial. So we'll end up talking a lot about games in AI. Uh, but then the learnings that we get from here are what are getting transferred into playing, into, into controlling humanoids or into controlling helicopters and so on. These are just places where uh, uh, not only your agent learns, but you also learn about the whole process of learning. Okay. So the game Backgammon uh, is again uh, was considered a very hard game for computers to solve. And uh, so people who don't know what, what Backgammon is, think of it as a two player Ludo. Everyone knows Ludo, right? Okay, so Ludo you have four players and then you take coins around the board, you cut your opponent and then your goal is to finally get your pieces off the board. So similarly Backgammon is like two player Ludo. But then you have a lot more pieces per side. So you can do all kinds of strategies and uh, so you can't cut the piece if there is more than one piece in the same square right? so you can kind of protect your pieces like that and so on so you can do all kinds of strategies right? but the main problem is you throw a die in the, in the playing of the game and you saw the initial uh, uh, game tree that we talked about for tic-tac-toe right the game tree had like a branching of nine which was at the root Right? But the average branching factor was very small. Right? After a few steps, you have like 7, 5 and so on and so forth. Right? The number of branches becomes smaller and smaller. But in the game of backgammon, the number of branches are of order of 400. Because of the way you throw the dice and the number of different pieces that you can move and so on and so forth. So it becomes a very hard game for uh, uh, computers to play. And uh, so Jerry Tessaro, who was at uh, IBM, who still at IBM, uh, came up with this uh, player called uh, Kitty Gammon, right, which uses the temporal reference rule uh, to try to play by Gammon right? And of course, he beat the best human player back in the 90s. Right? Uh, but what was very cool about the backgammon player was it learned completely by what is called self play. So, what do you mean by self play? The agent played against another copy of itself. Right? There was no human beings involved, except in, of course, setting up the whole thing. Right? And then it just kept playing game after game after game against itself. And then it learned to play at such a level that uh, soon we started playing, seeing moves that were not 
you know, considered good moves by humans, but which are actually resulting in better chances of winning than what you would see in uh, what, what was recommended by humans, right? Like I say here, new moves that was not recorded by humans in centuries of play of backgammon. So backgammon is, is a very popular game. It's just that we don't play it that much. It's very popular in the Middle East, and that's even the World Championship of backgammon. And uh, people have written books about backgammon strategies and things like that. Even there, these things haven't been recorded, and uh, this is just lots of things made. Right. So I'll come back to backgammon in a bit. Uh, but uh, I did have a slide that's a homage to DeepMind. Uh, because uh, they almost single-handedly as a company uh, revived interest in RL. Uh, it happened in 2014. Uh, they had like this uh, video demonstration of like live demonstration in one of the conferences. Yeah. So in case of bad given, uh, in case of self-play, how did they ensure that both the AIs don't go with the same tool every time? Because they are learning from the same situation. But they are playing for, one is playing for white, other is playing for black. So they can't make the... Same uh, yeah, yeah, so there is no way to ensure that, right? If they are going with the same move, what's going to happen? They are not going to win by a huge margin, right? So you are going to say, okay, I played that move last time, so it didn't lead me, lead me to a big, big win, so let me try playing something else, right? So you are going to start exploring. That's why I said the trial and error part is very important in doing for people. If you are not having that exploration component, you will get stuck in something somehow, right? And the second thing is that uh, the even though I said you play against another copy of yourself, both agents don't learn at the same time. I think the way the backgammon thing was set up. So what happens is you take your current agent, right, make him dominant, and keep him fixed for say a hundred games or a thousand games or something, while the white guy alone learns, the black guy is fixed. And after a while you take the current version and then replace the opponent with that and go. So the opponent progressively becomes more and more uh, adept at playing the game, but it's not, not changing while you are playing as well. So that way, you, the white player alone can do the exploration and find all these new strategies for the game. It turned out to be, uh, in fact, there is no theory that says it should work. But it turns out to do really well. And the newest, newest version of uh, Alpha Zero actually learns to self play. Right? So the new version from DeepMind actually learns to self play. Not the one that I put on earlier. But the latest version does that. Anyway, going back, so they actually had this demonstration of playing Atari games. Right? Atari, Atari games are simple if you think about it. But what they did was they trained this Atari games from scratch. They, they just gave it raw pixels as input, and they're expecting the agent to give joystick commands as output. Right? So that was pretty tricky. And then of course they did the AlphaGo player and uh, kind of made the whole. Uh, World go crazy, right? So let's talk a little bit more about the Atari game. So what they did, right? It's learning from raw video input. So just think about it. So you have at least a couple of decades now of processing visual input, right? So you look at it, you say, okay, those are numbers there. Okay, they seem to be colored bars. Okay, these are some guys moving around. That's a ball. As soon as you see it move around, you know that okay, that's a ball that's being patterned around. Okay, this look like. I have seen enough uh, movies, right? So these look like aliens and I am firing them and so on and so forth. So you have this huge history that you are bringing to bear and you kind of you look at the screen, move around for a few minutes, you kind of understand the dynamics, right? Imagine an agent learning this from scratch. So I have no idea that these white pixels correspond to numbers, right? So I have no idea when I move my joystick, what I am moving is this green thingy up and down, not this green thingy, not this orange one, not the white ball. Right? I don't know what is responding to my joystick even. Right? So we are very good at figuring it out because we know what is normal dynamics and then... So all of this had to be learned from scratch. All it got were raw pixels as in. That's, that's why it's such a hard learning problem. If you think about it, uh, it's a very hard learning problem. What they did was they went uh, fell back on deep neural network, they used a complex neural network for processing as visual input right? and then used reinforcement learning on top of it. Right? Uh, at that time it was considered one of the hardest learning problems solved by computers because it did it with almost zero knowledge about what it was learning. So uh, other things had a lot of knowledge built in, this one worked with zero knowledge. But more importantly, uh, unlike the backgammon player or the helicopter examples that we saw earlier, this was widely reproducible. Because the Atari game simulators have been available for a long time. Right? They were built long before the uh, uh, DeepMind guys came on board. 
and also um, right uh, also the algorithm was very simple to reproduce right so they actually published algorithm in fact they released the original code so all of you could just download the simulator and the code and uh, if you have a decent gpu right you could train this and and uh, have it play directly right and also it gave you a complex enough domain where i could try out different things and and uh, and see where it takes you right and so that was that is one of the big reasons that uh, the kind of interest got revived. Right? So let's uh, look at what happened here. Um, so imagine, I still have no idea that I should move the joystick. Then I start off from there, right? I just stop somewhere and then I'm starting, right? And then I keep learning. I'm trying to fast forward this. It will take a long time, otherwise. Right? So we started learning, right? And now it's learning daily well. Now it's playing really well, but this is after several thousands, hundreds of thousands of frames. Right, and likewise, it uh, it can learn a bunch of different games. And uh, okay, so this is a uh, here they say a lucky run. So people know how to play breakout well. You dig a hole, and then you let the ball go through the top, and then it will just keep bouncing back and forth at the top, and then keep knocking the things off, so that you don't have to move anything at the bottom. So you will see that happen now, right? it went up and then it started knocking off the blocks there. right? So this, at this point of time when this video was made it was called a lucky run, but nowadays right now more training has been done, so it learns to do this every time, it is no longer a lucky run, it actually is learning to do this every time. right? And I will move forward. So here is a graphic from the original uh, 2015 paper. Right? Uh, forget about what the statistics mean. Right? Just pay attention to this line. So these are all different games that they were training the agent to play, and this line indicates human performance. Right? To this line, this side, the agent was better than humans. To this side, humans were better than agents. Right? This was in 2015. Now the line is here. So there's still one game on which uh, humans are useful. Right? So they wanted to be completely replaced with the gameplay scenario. Uh, but still, uh, boundaries are getting pushed. Right? People who can't read it, the game is more than human. Uh, so what is the secret sauce? What caused us to succeed now in 2014 that we couldn't do earlier? So going back to the backgammon player, so what Jerry Tessero did was used a very complex, uh, uh, not a complex, he used a neural network. Now in, in modern parlance, there is no longer complex, uh, but he used a neural network uh, to learn how to play the game. Forget about the actual mechanics, like I said, I am not going to get into the details. Okay? Uh, so he learned how to play the uh, game using this neural network. Um, but the point was, for input, right? He used this 198 dimension vector. Right? So each position in the board, he will describe using 198 different features. What are these 198 features? They were certainly not just the board position, right? How many pieces are there in each location? That's certainly not it, because I can encode that with just 30 features. He had 198 features. So there was something lot more thought had gone into it. But Jerry himself is a very good player of backgammon. So what he did was uh, he kind of put a lot of thought into it, designed all these very complicated features, and then he used that for representing the board. It turns out that this is very crucial. So one of the reasons that we are not able to reproduce Jerry's performance otherwise is we don't have access to those features. So IBM kind of made it proprietary. So we don't have access to the and the features that uh, Jerry used. Right? But then, remember, I said that you are learning to play from video input from scratch. Right? So what, what about the features in Atari games? Where were the features coming The features are coming from a deep neural network. Right? So it's a lot more, this is a lot more complex, it has got millions of parameters while uh, the backgammon, the DD gammon network had hundreds of parameters. Right? So the deep Q network has millions of parameters, but you can eventually break it down into a portion of the network that learns these features from scratch. 
right? And another portion of the network that learns it. So this featured learning is the power that deep learning brings to RL. Right? So that you don't need to have somebody sit very carefully and hand -pose. The same thing happened in the helicopter case. The same thing happened in the humanoid robot case. Somebody had to sit and code the thing. But nowadays, you have a lot of these applications where uh, the features are learned automatically using this kind of deep learning approaches and you are able to solve more and more complex problems. Right? So one of the, the, the hottest thing now is something called Alpha Zero, which DeepMind claims is a general AI algorithm. Uh, this general AI algorithm. But then there is a quote from Vishwanath uh, Anand. So Stockfish is a chess playing program right, which uh, grandmasters used to train against. In fact, Stockfish wins games against uh, against the Grandmaster. It's that strong a program, right? To watch such a strong program like Stockfish, against whom most top players would be happy to win even one game out of a hundred, be completely taken apart, is certainly definitive. So when uh, Alpha Zero played Stockfish, right, he just basically won, defeated, right, won by huge margins, right? And you remember I said that AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol, right? Alpha Zero beat AlphaGo 100 0. Okay? And so DeepMind has gotten to a point where they don't test their algorithms against humans anymore, based on time. They just test it against other programs. Right? So, so they have to have that report, uh, the, the possible thing. Right? So it's a single algorithm that not only learns to play chess. And Go, but also another uh, Japanese uh, board game called Shogi, which is a strategy game again. And of course, the next thing what we could do things like autonomous vehicles. Well, we are too late to get on board, right? So Waymo is starting out what 200,000 vehicles in, in, in a few months or something, and that's going to be crazy, right? So, but there are a whole bunch of other things that we can use RL for, right? So we could use build tutoring systems to help relieve. Well, I mean, get get all these integral videos. Better use for all the integral videos, right? Uh, or you could think about using this for agriculture. In fact, there are, there's a company in Israel that actually uses reinforcement learning to decide on watering schedules in plants and so on and so forth. Or we could use it for smarter energy. So Google actually uses reinforcement learning for controlling uh, water. I mean, uh, for power consumption in their uh, data centers and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, so a lot of excitement in the AI community. Uh, also a sense of responsibility because we, we truly believe that we can screw up things uh, now. So there's a lot of regulation and uh, things that could uh, that need to come up. Right? I mean as it was losing a game of chess. That's not screwing up, right? We could really screw up and mess up the world. And uh, so we we believe that we are closer than ever to functional AI. But pinch of salt, we already believed this before, so we believe again that we are closer to functional AI and we also believe that uh, if, um, yeah, I can go ahead and work space with humans, and therefore uh, that gives us gives rise to things like this. So, what's next for AI? Look at burgers. Okay. It's a robot called uh, Flippy, I think, and uh, they've actually started putting pushing it out into shops. I mean, there is one place in uh, I think it's one, one place in Australia where actually Flippy serves you, makes you burgers. So, so you can't even say if you are useless at anything, at least go work in a burger shop. Even that you can't say. Anything. So it's better figure out what you are going to do with your life, right? But then, of course, you don't have to be scared. I don't. I don't believe in a dystopian future like this, right? Uh, look at that. A is potentially more dangerous than nukes. And where does he fund open AI then? I have no idea. Uh, but anyway. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't like that, and I would like to see AI come in the news more like this. AI helps old lady crossbreed, hangs around with kids, and cooks food. And of course, if you want to know more, more got more pain, you can go to this URL, which has links to all my NPTEL videos on RL and ML and other things. And uh, 